All right. Um, well, I'm a little nervous to start first, but I guess I'm excited to be able to sit in the audience and watch everyone else go from here. But I wanted to talk to you today about creating, about making. I, uh, I took my first ceramics class 20 years ago. I was a senior in high school, and I still remember watching Mr. Dillon throw a lump of clay on the wheel and work magic. I knew from that time that I wanted this to be something that was a part of my life. And being a senior in high school, I had my whole world figured out. I knew what I was going to do. I knew what my major was going to be. And I had a love of math and computers were on everyone's minds. So I knew I was going to be a computer programmer. But this ceramics class started to change things. I started college as a computer science major, but I quickly found that I was spending all of my extra time in the ceramics studio. In fact, my friends mentioned once that they hadn't seen me in the studio for a while, and they asked what was going on, if everything was okay. It started to become a big part of my life. <clears throat> As I spent more time in the studio, I met people who had dreams of teaching ceramics, and they talked about graduate school. I thought at first they were crazy, but I soon found myself thinking like they did. I got my first job teaching at a small rural high school in southern Utah. Then I went to graduate school in Pennsylvania, and then I started teaching here in the Canyon School District about eight years ago. I've seen students get caught with the same bug that caught me when I was a student. I even have a few students who have become ceramics teachers themselves. When I talk about what got me involved in ceramics and how making became such a big part of my life, I often find myself talking about cups. Handmade cups are different than a cup that you buy at the store. Anybody can go to Walmart and buy a cup that looks just like the cup that the person in line of them, in front of them in line just purchased. But a handmade cup is different. Every handmade cup, every student makes a handmade cup. And in 13 years of teaching, I've never seen a student make the same one twice. In his lecture, How a Handmade Cup Can Save the World, Potter Chris Staley stated, just as everyone's fingerprints are different, so too are handmade cups. When I think about cups, I visit them often. It's the first thing that I throw when I go to my studio. It's also the first thing that students learn how to make. And just like every cup is different, every student's experience with making is different. And that's why I think making has become more and more important. Cups have a special role that they play in our lives, whether it's huddled up next to a fire on a cold winter day, drinking a nice cup of hot chocolate, or whether it's raised in the air in celebration of some life event, cups are there for the events of our lives. I had a professor in college that talked about cups. I just wanted that one to live. <laughs> um, I had a professor in college who talked about cups, and he said that the most important decision he made each morning was which cup to drink his morning coffee from. And I used to think, well, he's got to find some more important things to do during the day. But what I think he was really talking about was that morning ritual of drinking his coffee, something he did every single day, was enhanced by the use of a handmade cup. So where did my making come from? I think back to that ceramics class, other teachers that I had in school. I think back to my parents encouraging me to make and create my own things when I was young. I think like most kids, I got an art set when I was pretty young. And they encouraged me to build and to draw and to make things. 
I think kids are born with that sense of wonder and discovery, but they're also born creators. They want to make things. Um, I see that in my own kids all the time. I have an eight-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son. <clears throat> my daughter is kind of notorious for curling up in a corner somewhere, finding a book, some paper, and starting to write stories. She's started illustrating her stories as well. We don't encourage her, prompt her, or tell her that it's something that's got to be done. She just does it naturally. She's also pretty good at building traps, as you kind of see in this picture. Building traps to keep her brother out of her workspace as she works. But she's an artist. In her mind, that's what she is. She's a creator. My son's not much different, except that he tells stories as he builds and plays. So his events, his creations act out a narrative on the stage of the clay or whatever it is he's working with. Even his plants versus zombies, pipe cleaner creations act out events from the game as he plays for hours. I see these things in my kids and I know that other kids are born with those same ideas and that same interest in making. And mostly my son here, he's just trying to figure things out. But my kid's favorite thing to do is to hang out with me in my studio, in our basement at our home. When my daughter was four years old, she helped me build a table where she could work next to me and create things side by side. Now that my son is four years old, he sits at that same table and builds things and creates right next to his sister. They collaborate, they teach each other, they communicate with no prompting from me. They want to build. And it makes me think about the things that our students spend their time doing with their hands all day long. And I just can't help but wonder if they're not capable of a whole lot more. When I was a, a kid and was first introduced to technology, it was through a Commodore 64. I still remember building a rocket ship that would fly across the screen and a poison logo that exploded in 64-bit pixelated fireworks. Today, when kids come to computers, they're consuming rather than creating. And I think that could change. Kids need the experience of making. In his book, Shop Classes, Soul Craft, Matthew B. Crawford stated, in schools, we create artificial learning environments for our children that they know to be contri contrived and undeserving of their full attention. Without the opportunity for, to, for, to learn through the hands, the world remains abstract and distant, and the passions for learning will not be engaged. Our students are capable of creating and building and designing just as they would when they start any career. When students leave our classrooms, they won't be asked to write an essay about a book or turn in a book report or finish a handout or complete a worksheet. They'll be asked to create side by side with peers to evaluate their work and the work of others. Students in our app development club are working together side by side to design an app that didn't exist before they walked into the computer lab. They talk to each other, they share ideas, they communicate about their differences, and they come up with solutions for an app that will hopefully be published later this year. We see activities like this in our art classrooms and CTE classrooms throughout our schools. But more and more, these are the kinds of programs that are being cut from our schools. We need experiences where our students can create, share what they know, and be engaged so that when they leave our schools, they can create and share what they know and be engaged. Our employers and job hunters throughout the state and throughout the country are looking for students with these skills. <clears throat> so the next thing I wanna talk about is this idea of the maker movement. The maker movement's not new. Ever since people have been making things, it's been a movement. But the maker movement's connection to education is still budding and still growing. 
through the maker movement is all about creation. It's about prototyping, designing, sharing ideas, and then putting those out into the world where others can collect those ideas and create their own. Uh, the maker movement is about all of these things here. Most of all, it's about experimentation. Our students, our teachers, our community members are all involved in this process, and we can be involved as well. Technology's played a pretty major role in advancing this maker movement idea. This is a student working on a 3D printer. I visited a school in Salt Lake District just a couple of months ago where a student was printing parts and pieces to build another 3D printer. Gary Steger and Sylvia Martinez said in their book, making something is a powerful personal expression of intellect. It creates ownership. Even when you make something that isn't perfect, people value their creations, even flawed creations, more than the same things created perfectly by experts. Part of the maker movement is also about maker's fairs. It's a place where you project and share and put out into the world the things that you've made and also connect with other makers in the world. I've seen this in the form of hack nights, programming nights, where everyone comes together and creates a project by the end of the night. Maker's fairs are hap happening all over the country. You can see very few in Utah. We have an opportunity to change that. I want to end with a couple of ideas about things that I've seen in my classroom. Our teachers in our classrooms have the ability to engage students in a hands-on, project-based learning type environment. We can create those things. Just as our CTE classes and art classes have been doing for years, we can incorporate those ideas into our math, science, and other core classes. When students create projects, they learn something beyond just the curriculum that they're learning in your classroom. They learn how to communicate, collaborate, work on teams, evaluate their own work, and evaluate the work of their peers. A colleague of mine that I have been collaborating with and sharing with for years, uh, Kate Plows, is a ceramics and computer art teacher in Philadelphia, put it this way. She said students learn perseverance, grit, follow through, creating multiple iterations, patience, and flexibility. Whether it's a handmade ceramic cup, and this one's going to live, there it is, um, or a computer program that gets built in a computer lab with other students. All of those things are made. All of those things are real and authentic. This pot that I'm building may, might be called old fashioned. Maybe our ceramics classes don't have a place in high school, some might say. But this is definitely authentic. It takes up space and it holds space. It's up to us to help our students understand that creating can be a part of their lives and that they're capable of those kinds of things. Our students can learn from the time that they're young that their creative impulses are, are good and correct. And we can encourage those impulses throughout college, throughout their careers, so that we continue to have the most innovative workforce in the world. I think it's our job as teachers to make sure that our students are always engaged always curious, always collaborating, and always creative. Thank you.